I want to say just one thing to you to start, which is faya lobi. Do you know what that means? Does anyone know what faya lobi means? I didn't know what it meant either. Um, I was walking out of a uh, Johannes Pengel International Airport in Paramaribo, Suriname, with 10 graduate students, and we were carrying what looked like an improvised structure. Our luggage had fallen apart in Trinidad on the way there. And also in Trinidad, one of our grad students had broken her foot singing karaoke. <laughs> she was really exuberant, and some of you may meet her because she teaches in Bangalore. So we had a student with a broken foot. All our luggage had fallen apart. The bags had been somehow shredded in um, Trinidadian customs. Uh, so we strapped all of the remaining contents of our luggage to the tops of these two two-by-fours we found in a dumpster in the airport in Guyana. We had the one student with the broken foot, so she, we were sort of dragging her along with it. And as we walked through the door of the airport, someone yelled at us, Faya Lobi! But he was smiling, so I figured it was okay. <laughs> so as soon as you walk through that door or any door, metaphorically, spiritually, or physically, your work as U of M students and researchers becomes a whole lot more complex. But hold on to that image of the door, because I'll come back to that. So I also have to say that before we went to Suriname, I didn't know where it was. Do you know, does anyone know where it is? Wow, isn't that amazing? Here we are in 21st century. It is, used to be Dutch Guiana. It's just north of Brazil. So it was amazing. It was amazing that our dean supported a group of graduate students going to a place that no one had heard of. We had a project. Um, we gathered materials. We did our research. One of the research things that we did in preparation for going that I would highly recommend, but you should do it more robustly than we did, is I asked each student to attend a religious observation different from a different religion than they had been raised in. And we had like a small ethical question there when a student who had been raised Presbyterian asked if it was okay to go to a congregational service. Would that be different <laughs> enough? Which I, I had worries about that student from the time that we left. So we, we had a partner, we did our research, we signed an MOU, and we sent our MOU DHL with a, D, a return DHL envelope. And when they got it in Suriname, they said, what a beautiful yellow envelope this is. And they took the DHL envelope and put it in a regular mailbox so it never got back to us. So we left Ann Arbor with nothing signed. We had taken a Dutch class that we found through Reckon Ed. There was someone who taught German. Um, Suriname, as a former Dutch colony, spoke, we understood, spoke Dutch. So we took a Dutch class. We were all prepared with five days of Dutch classes from a German woman. And we got a whole bunch of U of M t-shirts to give as gifts to our hosts. It was also the transition from Dutch guilders to Surinamese dollars. And you can imagine how hard it was to find either guilders or Surinamese dollars in Ann Arbor. So we couldn't get currency. We brought this strange assortment of euro coins that someone had, some dollar bills, and our ATM cards, which we figured would work. Day one was a Sunday when we got there. No banks were open. Day two was a bank holiday Monday, and everything was closed. And day three, we looked for the banks, but we could find none of them. Day four, we found a bank, but it had no ATM. And by now, we had learned that Dutch was a formal language that you learned in classes and to pass exams. We had enough Dutch that could be polite, or we could have conversations with children. And we learned that the street language was called Sranantongo, and in Sranantongo, Faya Lobi means crazy love. And evidently, uh, they thought we were a wedding party, and we were hoisting the bride up on the stretcher, and so they yelled, Faya Lobi, crazy love, and what a great way to be greeted. And I would encourage you all to have, keep that in mind as we go on to this adventure. Um, so we found, a bank, we found that there was one bank in the capital that had an ATM, but they wouldn't be open until Monday. So in the interim, we had found that there were mango and papaya trees that grew in the courtyard of the housing compound that we were staying in. And we had traded all of our Go Blue apparel for um, bananas, Indonesian pastries called gulong gulong that were beautiful pink coconut things. And we got a really big fish that was called bang bang, because all of the Sranantongo names for animals were names like they, the sounds that they make. And we learned from, their, from our neighbors where the callaloo plants grew and we, that we could stew their leaves and eat them like spinach. We also learned how if a chicken walked down the road, how you could grab it by its neck and go like that and kill it right away and eat it. So we were all set, apparently. <laughs> Luckily, no chickens walked by. I was sort of squeamish anyway. And a group of monkeys threw coconuts at us. It was later that once I realized, we realized they were coconuts and they were edible that we 
thought of it more as that they were throwing them to us rather than at us. But for a little while, we felt somewhat persecuted. So we were all sent for food. We still didn't have any money. But really, like all of you, we had done a lot to prepare for this trip. What we had not realized is that although we knew that we had the specifics practiced in terms of work and discipline, we had all the materials and the things that we were supposed to work on, we had a partner, and we had practiced and prepared in the, ma in the ways that we thought, but the aspects of our preparation that were equally consequential were the practices of entering a community as visitors, of being humble guests, and of learning how to learn on the ground, and I would say on your toes, and I hope all of you in most ways know that the specifics of what you're bringing with you in terms of your projects are only good as your abilities to think on your feet and to respond to local knowledge. As much as our ambitions and aspirations were to realize an ambitious project, we were completely kicked out by the heat and spent most of our days sort of lounging in these ha municipal hammocks by the river. At one point worrying if we were gonna get money and then by the time Monday came around, we had enough food and we had stopped worrying. That weekend, we spent with our peers, the graduate students we were working with at the IOL, the Institut für Obleiding von Lehrern, the Advanced Teacher Training Institute that did actually speak Dutch there. We wandered the streets with our partners, and these are the same streets that we had studied through the UNESCO documents, through GIS, library research, but this time from the vantage point of local knowledge, and the magnitude both of what we did not know and what we were learning. This complexity, the flux of emergent systems and dynamic thinking that we engage here on a daily basis at the university in our research, in our coursework, expands exponentially in contact with the world's different languages, desires, and aspirations. Remember that the door, the one that we walked through at the airport, or the one that you're going to walk through in May? If you, I often like to think of the roots of the word door, which in Latin comes from the words that we use for portal the threshold that we go through. It's the same Greek pori, which is what our skin is, the pores of our skin, to be porous, and the nature of the word opportunity. To be porous is to allow opportunity to pass through, to seize opportunity, ideally. Nets are porous, although if you're a big fish like a bang bang, you may see it as a trap. But remember that the openings of those nets are bigger than the membranes that close passages off. To be truly open to the opportunities of high impact creative scholarship is to slip those traps of habit, of facility, and to be porous in your work as makers and doers. On Monday when we got to the bank, the one with the ATM, we waited because as the one ATM in the entire country, it was a long line. So we did our best in Srananthongo and Dutch to explain to everybody who was curious about us with our broken footed colleague and the remnants of our two by four structure, why we were there and what we were doing there. When we got to the front of the line, we were faced with the screen with a completely indecipherable language. It turns out that the Bank of Bonaire and Senecius ATM only worked in Papiamento, which is a hybrid language between Dutch, Spanish, and Amerindian languages that are spoken only in these tiny islands, Bonaire, Senecius, and a bit in Curacao. It didn't matter, you know, on an ATM roughly, in which orientation the buttons are. You press the green one if you want to keep going. And it didn't matter. <laughs> By this point, we had enough food and our assembled group knew how to figure things out. So let's use, all use our collective powers to create nets to catch contingency. After all, the chance of things succeeding favors the prepared mind. And by engaging the world in its known and still to be confronted intricacies, we craft our own nets to seize the opportunities that we encounter in an interdependent world. And you'll do this all wonderfully. And remember to have Faya Lobby for your work and for your partners, for your communities, and for each other. So go through that door and have crazy love.